How many of you wonder, as we look at the world around us, that a lot of folks see things differently than others? Have you noticed that? That a lot of things in life depend on your perspective. They depend on what you see things, how you see the world. Don't let you stare at that picture too long. It'll mess with your head. But uh, we struggle with that. And I think sometimes even in the faith, even as followers of Christ, we can get our perspective a little bit askew, a little bit off where it needs to be, and begin to see things only from our point of view and what we experience, rather than helping us see things as God desires us to see things. And we're going to look at a text, and it's rather lengthy, so as we read it, just know that I'm not going to, I don't have time to preach that entire text. Obviously, this morning, it's extremely long, and there is so much here uh, that uh, it would literally take weeks to get through it. This is a deep, deep text. There's a lot here. We're just going to kind of skim it and, and hit a few high points, but I want you to understand that. So I'm not trying to, I'm not going to, as, as the, uh, the preacher term is, I'm not going to exegete the whole text. We're going to kind of go through it, but I wanted to read the whole text because I want you to see the context of what Isaiah is saying. So if you would, and you're able, would you stand me in honor of reading God's word, Isaiah 40, verses 1 through 31, this morning. Get it all going here. Here we go. All right. And the prophet writes, he says, Comfort, O comfort my people, says, the God, says your God. Speak kindly to Jerusalem. Call out to her that her warfare has ended and her iniquity has been removed. And she has received of the Lord's hand double for all her sins. A voice is calling, Clear the way of the Lord in the wilderness. Make smooth in the desert a highway for our God. Let every valley be lifted up, every mountain and hill be made low. Let the rough ground become plain and the rugged terrain a broad valley. Then the glory of the Lord will be revealed, and all flesh will see it together, for the mouth of the Lord has spoken. A voice says, Call out. Then he answered, What shall I call out? All flesh is grass, and all its loveliness is like the flower of the field. The grass withers, the flower fades, when the breath of the Lord blows upon it. Surely the people are like grass. The grass withers, the flower fades, but the word of our God stands forever. Get yourself up on a high mountain, O Zion, bearer of good news. Lift your voice mightily, O Jerusalem, bearer of good news. Lift it up, do not fear. Say to the cities of Judah, here is your God. Behold, the Lord God will come with might, with his arm ruling for, for him. And behold, his reward is with him and his recompense before him. Like a shepherd, he will tend his flock. In his arm, he will gather the lambs and carry them in his bosom. And he will gently lead the nursing ewes. Who has measured the waters in the hollow of his hand and marked off the heavens by a span and calculated the dust of the earth by the measure and weighed the mountains in the balance and the hills on a pair of scales? Who has directed the spirit of the Lord and who, or as his counselor, has informed him? With whom did he consult and gave him understanding? Who taught him the path of justice? Who taught him knowledge and informed him the way of the way of understanding? Behold, the nations are like a drop from the bucket. And they are regarded as a speck of dust on the scales. Behold, he lifts up the islands like fine dust. Even Lebanon is not enough to burn, nor its beast enough for a burnt offering. All the nations are as nothing before him. They are regarded him as less than nothing and meaningless. To whom then will you liken God? Or what likeness will you compare with him? As for the idol, a craftsman casts it, a goldsmith plates it with gold, a silversmith fashions chains of silver. He who is too impoverished for such an offering selects a tree that does not rot, and he seeks it out for himself, seeks out for himself a skilled craftsman to prepare an idol that will not totter. Do you not know? Have you not heard? Has it not been declared to you from the beginning? Have you not understood from the foundations of the earth? It is he who sits above the circle of the earth, and its inhabitants are like grasshoppers, who stretches out the heavens like a curtain and spreads them out like a tent to dwell in. He it is who reduces rulers to nothing, who makes the judges of the earth meaningless. Scarcely have they planted, scarcely have they been sown, scarcely has their stock taken root on the earth. But he merely blows on them and they wither, and a storm carries them away like stubble. To whom then will you liken me, that I would be his equal, says the Holy One? Lift up your eyes on high, and see who has created these stars. The one who leads forth their host by number, he calls them by name because of the greatness of his might and the strength of his power. Not one of them is missing. Okay, all right. Don't you love it when it does this to you? All right, there we go. Why do you say, O Jacob, and assert, O Israel, my way is hidden from the Lord, and the justice due me escapes notice of the notice of my God? Do you not know, have you not heard, the everlasting God, the Lord, the creator of the end of the earth, does not become weary or tired? His understanding is inscrutable. He gives strength to the weary, and to him who lacks might, he increases power. Though youths grow weary and tired and vigorous, young men stumble badly, yet they who wait upon the Lord will renew their strength. 
They will mount up with wings like eagles. They will run and not grow weary. They will walk and not faint. Would you pray with me, Father? Thank you for your word. Thank you for the testimony of the prophet as he speaks to us today. And I pray, Father, you use me as your vessel to faithfully communicate your word to your people, what you want us to hear and how you want us to apply it, that our lives might be, continue to be more transformed into the image of, of your son, that we might begin to live lives that demonstrate your goodness, your grace, and your righteousness in a world that desperately needs to see it. Father, thank you for each who are here today. Bless them, encourage them, and remind them of the great love you have for them and also the call you've placed on every one of our lives. Use this time as you desire, for it's in Jesus' name we pray, amen. You may be seated. All right, so like I said, you're gonna say, well, why didn't you talk about this part? Because this is big. This text is loaded with so many powerful things to say. We're gonna just focus on a handful of them, and I would encourage you to spend some time reading and studying this text. Isaiah 40 is really kind of the linchpin of the entire book of Isaiah. <clears throat> what comes before and after, not that it's not important, but this is kind of where Isaiah capsulizes everything that he says in the other 66 books or chapters of this, this great prophecy. It really is the, the, the focus and hones it in on us and what he desires. And it's all about us beginning to see God from a proper perspective. Because you see in the days when this was written, the children of Israel had a problem very similar to the one we had today, they, they saw God and believed that God was God, but they thought there were other gods as well. And they kind of had this perspective that, well, you know, he's really strong, but there's other gods out there and we've got to honor them. We've got to respect them because we live in the land of the people that worship them. And the Israelites had a real problem with idolatry. I didn't know if you were aware of that. You can look at the text and see that again and again throughout the, the books of the various prophets as they declare that. But Isaiah is in a time where the people have kind of gotten really satisfied with where they were in their walk with God and, and the temple and everything. They thought everything was okay and they were just you know, gonna do everything they were supposed to do and everything was gonna be you know, fine. And Isaiah's trying to warn them that judgment's coming. You better pay attention to what God has to say to you, he says. You better listen to this. This is important because it's, it's such a pivotal part of their history and also a very important part of us because you probably noticed at the beginning of this text kind of a foreshadowing. There's a, a part where it talks about preparing the way, making it straight, obviously a reference to John the Baptist, who would make the way straight for our Savior, or the, the, the forerunner of, the, of our Savior. And that's a reference. There's other references in here. But what I really want us to hone in on is kind of, kind of come towards the end of this text. And we're going to really kind of focus in on verses, I believe it's 26 and following. We'll get there in just a few moments. But I love the perspective here of God. He's like, he's trying to tell the people through, through Isaiah you guys are, are worried about so much. You see so many things. Do you not understand who I am? Do you not grasp the reality of who the God of the universe truly is? This is not someone we, you know, kind of casually look at, someone we think, oh, wow, he's really, he's nice. And we kind of have that problem a little bit in our culture today. We kind of have this view of God as someone who sits on a throne, he's just kind of twiddling his thumbs waiting for something to happen. Or some people see him as a loving grandfather, wouldn't harm a fly that just kind of sits around and like everybody wants, I want everybody to be my friend. He's desperately in need of a love and attention. Both of those perspectives of God are greatly, how can I say this? They're heretical, okay? They are not any, have nothing to do with the God of Scripture, the God of the Old and New Testament. They have nothing to do with the God of the Bible. They have everything to do with our perception of what we want God to be. Our God is one who is above all. I love that. He's, he's sitting above the circle of the earth. The idea is there's God looks over all things and sees all things. He, he reigns completely. And it says that the inhabitants of the earth are like what? Did you catch what he said there? Let's see if you were listening. Grasshoppers. There we go. How many of you love grasshoppers? You know? There's, there's so many of them, they become irritating at certain times of the year. I, don't, I haven't noticed that as much in Maryland. I did notice a lot in the Midwest because we had a lot of farm country out there where we lived. And grasshoppers, they get really irritating, and they get, there's a lot of them. But that's the idea that we're just like, that's what we are to him from perspective. That's what we would be like. Now, I don't know how you know, excited you get about grasshoppers and other insects, that you want to protect them and save them, that you really care about their daily lives. I don't, except when they get in my way, right? But yet the God of the universe, even though that is the perspective that we have and that we really are worth no more than that, sees us and loves us intimately and uniquely, each and every one of us, as if we were the only grasshopper on the planet. But Isaiah wants us to understand who God is, that he is above us, he is beyond us, he is God. As it says in another one of Isaiah's, in, this, in, in, the, in the book of Isaiah, one of my favorite quotes that he says, I am the Lord, there is no other. I don't know how he can make it more plain than that. 
There is no other God besides him. There aren't, it's not like, you know, sometimes people think, well, there's all these gods out there and then there's God. No, there's no other gods. They're all fake. They're all frauds. And there's the one Lord God of heaven and everybody else is a sham. That's really what he's trying to say here. And who he is and the perspective that he has of our lives and the universe. And, you know, I know a lot of times you look at the news, CNN, Fox, doesn't matter. And you look like the world is spiraling out of control, Right. Would you agree we got problems? If you look and watch the news, if you watch the news for very long, you will get depressed, I guarantee you. Folks, they are just people like us trying to understand things like we are. And sorry, I'm going to be mean for a moment. They don't know any more than you or I do. They really don't. Some have been to school. In fact, I know the school that some have been to because I used to live 20 miles from at the University of Missouri, and I know what they teach there because I've been there. They're mistaken. Their perspective is skewed. They don't see things the way they're supposed to be seen. So why do we listen to them? Why do we place our hopes and dreams on what they tell us? Because they don't know what they're talking about. What we need to listen to is the Lord God of heaven and what he tells us about life. His perspective. Because, you know, he has seen the beginning and he knows the end and all of it's like today to him and he knows where we are going and what he desires to do with our lives and we need to trust him on the perspective that he has for us and the plans that he has for you and your family. Because he knows what is best for you. Do you believe that? We say we do. We say, I, I believe God has what's, and yet then we get all caught up and, oh, but you know what? Well, I saw this today that this is going to happen. And yeah, there's going to be things that are going to happen in this world that are bad. Because people are messed up. Amen? All of us are. We are messed up. That's called sin. We have flaw in our character. It's, it's a flaw. It's called sin. It, it corrupts us. And we are a little selfish. And that's going to continue until Jesus comes back, brothers and sisters. That's what it's going to be. But we serve a God who is above and beyond that, a God who does not have flaws in his character. He is not limited like we are by circumstances and time. He is a God who knows all, sees all, understands all, and desires to do a work in and through your life and mine. Did you know that? He desires to accomplish something in and through you that is beyond your ability and understanding, but he has the, he has the perspective. He knows what's going to happen, and he wants you to trust him on the journey, even though there are times it doesn't look like he knows what he's doing. It's like, God, haven't you watched the evening news? Don't you know what's going on in the world? That's a really silly thought, but we do that, don't we? And we fret and we wonder and we worry and we get all upset and like, God, God's out of, the world's out of control. What's God going to do? Well, what's God's backup plan? Doesn't have one. Never had a backup plan. He doesn't need a backup plan. I need a backup plan always. Anybody else have those? All the time. I've got to, you know, I think the military term is a contingency plan. A good friend of mine is an old ranger, and that's what I was told. I've got to have a contingency plan. He's always, Scott was always saying that. We've got to have that. And I'm like, okay. But, you know, we'd say, but God doesn't have a contingency plan. He doesn't need one. Because his will will ultimately always be accomplished. Even though there are days and there are times when it looks like it's not going to happen, when it looks like it's not going to work out, it always works out. I want you to just remember for a moment with me what it was like when our Savior was on this planet, and it looked like, you remember what, anybody remember Palm Sunday, what that was like? You remember reading that in the scripture? Pretty big time. Disciples were excited. Everything looked like it was going. It looked like the world was finally getting that Jesus is the Messiah. It looked like it was going to be a great week. You remember that? How many of us know how that week ended? Didn't go as well as the disciples had hoped. They're scattered. It's a mess. Everything looks like it's over. It looks like Jesus has failed. It's, it, he's betrayed. Everything goes against what they expected to happen. They think, God, it's over. Your plan has failed. What, what are we going to do now? And the disciples are afraid, aren't they? I would be if I were one of them too. I'd been right with them in the deepest, darkest hole, wherever we could find a place to hide so the Romans wouldn't catch us because I don't want to go to a cross, and I'm sure none of them did either. And yet the God of heaven, the creator of all the universe, the one who is the almighty one, the ancient of days, did he fret and worry and say, oh boy, what am I going to do now? No. It was all in his plan. He knew what was going to happen. He knew how it would unfold. He knew what was going to take place. And he had, Jesus had tried to tell his disciples, you guys need to prepare. You need to pray. You need to get yourselves ready because this is going to be a tough day. It's going to be tough. It's going to be hard. And you need to get your attention focused on the one that matters. And they were too busy falling asleep like we would be, right? And they didn't have the right perspective. Do you understand where I'm coming from here? They saw the world down here, okay? Which is the way we often see it. We see it at ground level. We barely see what's going on. 
Now, this is not real accurate because God's a lot higher than the, than the podium here, but this is just to help you. But God sees it from way up here. He sees everything, and he knows what's going on, and he has a plan. It's not that he manipulates it and makes it work. He just knows how it's going to work out, and he's not worried because he knows that his plans are unstoppable. His purpose, his desires will be accomplished because of who he is. And that's the key, sec- that's the key here. He is the Lord God of heaven. He is the creator of all that is. And let's kind of, let's mosey on down to 26 here and following. Let's start at 25. I like this. He goes, to whom then will you liken me, says the Lord God? Who's my equal? Who's going to match God in a cage match? You know, who's going to be the one that goes against him? Yeah, that's the rest. I grew up watching a lot of wrestling. I was a weird kid. Who's going to deal with him? Who can handle God? Who's going to be his adversary? He says. Lift up your eyes on high, he says, to see the one who has created these stars, the one who leads forth their host by number. I understand. Calls them all by name because of the greatness of his might and the strength of his power. Not one of them is missing. Have you thought about that before? The one who orchestrated all that we see, the one that created the world that we live in and and the world beyond us, the universe is the one who has all things in control. It is under his hand. He knows what to accomplish, what he's desiring to do. And then I love this, verse 27. What do you say, O Jacob, and assert, O Israel, my way is hidden from the Lord, and the justice do me escapes the notice. They're saying like, you know, God doesn't know what's going on in my life. I deserve justice. I deserve this. And God ignores me because God doesn't know. God doesn't understand what's going on in my life. Do you realize how arrogant and foolish that statement is? Somebody does. That's good. That it is just something that, that's okay, don't worry about it. That's that injustice, that un- misunderstanding, that, that desire in our hearts and lives, that it's all about what we see and not about what God sees. God sees everything, knows everything. Let me, let me go on here. I'm, I'm, do you not know, have you not heard the everlasting God, the Lord, the creator of the ends of the earth? He's trying to help us understand that God created everything. All right? There is nothing, nothing that he doesn't understand, nothing that he doesn't comprehend, nothing that's, not, that's beyond his realm of experience. You know, I go into things, if I go to the, see the mechanic, okay, and take my car in, why do I do that? Because I've tried and it didn't work, which is usually dangerous. I don't do much anymore with cars to fix them because cars, are, number one now, are just way too complicated. They're not like they were when I was in high school, and you know, the, those ones built in the 1960s and 70s, you could fix a lot of those things. Now it's just, I'm going to make it worse if I mess with it. I, I know that. And I don't have a great deal of mechanical ability anyway, so why bother? So it's just easier and actually cheaper for me in the long run just to take to somebody that knows what they're doing, right? That's why we go to a mechanic, or we go to someone like that, or you go to the doctor when you're sick, right? You're supposed to. Some of us struggle with that, don't we, guys? But We're supposed to because why? The doctor knows what he or she is doing. They've been to medical school. They've studied these things. Many of them, I I don't mind having a doctor with a lot of gray hair. That excites me. Because that means he's seen a lot. Or or, or if it's a woman, they've seen a lot. They understand what's going on in my life and what what happened because they've been down this road before. And I go there because they have understanding in that. And they know more than I do about the way this thing works. Why do we have so much trouble going to the creator of the universe who knows abundantly more than any human expert can ever know in their field? He knows all things. He knows your life. He knows the ins and outs of your life. He knows where your life is going. He knows the purpose, plan, trajectory of your life, where you will end up, what you will do, how he can best use you. He knows all of that. Because he sees it. He doesn't know it because he hopes it. He knows it because he sees it. That's the idea that Isaiah is trying to get across. God has that perspective. He sees the way things are going to work out. He knows the future. He understands the way things are. Who better to place our trust in than that that person? Does that make sense? Trusting him, allowing the creator to lead us. He goes on and he says, uh, uh, this is the part of the text that that I just love, he, he, does not, he sees the ends of the earth, he does not become weary or tired, his understanding is inscrutable. And then we get in verse 29. He gives strength to the weary. To him who lacks might, he increases power. Anybody ever been weary? Really? You know, I mean, I'm not talking tired. That's usually how you get after, towards the end of my message. But I mean, maybe in the middle, I don't know. 
but weary. Like you just, you know, it's been one of those weeks, and we all have them, don't we, at times. Or sometimes it's been one of those mornings, right? And there, there's just not enough caffeine in that coffee to keep us awake, right? And we have those moments, and we're just kind of weary, and we're kind of, Lord, what are we going to do? And he's, where, do we, where can we get our might, our strength, our, the jolt we need literally to continue? That's what he tells us right here. What does he say? To him who lacks, do not become weary or tired. He's understanding school. He gives strength to the weary. To him who lacks might, he does what? He increases power. I love this. Though youth grow weary and tired and vigorous young men stumble badly, yet they that wait for the Lord will gain new or renew their strength. They will mount up on wings like eagles. They will run and not grow weary. They will walk and not faint. Can you imagine what it would be like to run and not be weary? Some of you know I, I, I run for exercise, not for speed. Every high school cross-country runner in this community could destroy me in the 5K. I know that. It wouldn't even be close. They would be done and drinking coffee before I came across the finish line. I'm very confident that I know that. I don't run because I'm fast. I run because I'm trying to run away from this. But anyway, that there's a time when you're doing that, you get tired. And there's that way in other things. Have you ever gotten tired of what you're doing? You know, you're doing something hard physically and it just kind of wears you out. And you're like, I don't know if I can go forward. I don't know if I can go on. Maybe, you know, maybe you don't get, hopefully you don't get that tired. But sometimes we do. We wear ourselves out. And a lot of times we do that in life, don't we? And it may not have as much to do with physical exertion as it has to do with our emotions and all the things that we experience. And we're just kind of going around and we're like, I don't know if I can take one more step. I'm done. I'm spent. It's over. I will give you strength. I will help you get through. I will move you on. I have the power to do this and to empower your life because he is above and beyond us. Once again, the perspective of who God is. God sees all, knows all, has a desire and a purpose, a plan and a direction for your life. Did you know that? You do. He desires to do something amazing and incredible with your life that you have no idea and I have no idea. We think we have our lives all mapped out. We think we have the plans of what God wants to, what we want to do with our lives today and think that's enough. But God said, no, I've, I've got it all worked out. You see, your life is part of many lives in the kingdom. Did you know that? We are all connected. We're connected as followers of Jesus Christ to our Savior, first, first and foremost, obviously, right? But there's a purpose, a plan, and a direction that the Savior has for all of us, moving all of us and not just South End Baptist Church, but all the churches, all the people of God, all of us together for the purpose of accomplishing his kingdom and doing what he wants us to do. To impact the nations for the gospel of Jesus Christ so that others may know of the goodness of God. They may have experienced God's grace and mercy. That's his desire. That's his perspective. His perspective is a mission that's a lot bigger than a lot of times we realize. It's not just about what we see from our perspective, he wants us to understand he has a greater perspective and to learn to trust the one who knows. As I said earlier, we have no trouble trusting people in this world with things like our cars and even our health because they what? Know more than we do. All right? And the older I get, the more I'm realizing just how little I know. What's interesting, I was in college. When you're in college, you think you know everything, right? Anybody been there? Been around college freshmen? love college freshmen, but they think they know it all. I was, did campus ministry for three or four years, and that's, they knew everything. I mean, there was, you couldn't tell them anything. It's really funny to see them when they became adults. But anyway, and they experienced life. Because the more I experienced in life, the more I began to realize. Because I was a freshman in college, and I thought I knew everything. And I had a professor that told me, in, in of all places, an intro to philosophy class. That sounds like a, how many sounds that sounds exciting to you? A couple of us, okay. We're weird. I'm just going to tell you because I'm weird. I know that. that. I enjoyed that class, and that gentleman's gone home to be with Jesus now, but was a good friend for many years and a mentor of mine. But Dr. Dr. Cochran would, he, I remember that first day he told us, guys and ladies, we had one girl in the class. She was brave. You think you know everything, but the reality is the longer you live, the realize, you will realize the less you know. There's too much to know out there. You will never grasp it all. He said, there's only one that knows everything. And you're not him. That's how he started philosophy class. But I think it was a good perspective on life. As I live my life, as you live your life, as you're experiencing all the things that you're experiencing in this life, 
you're going to come across things that are going to, they're going to cause you to slip. They're going to cause you to stumble. They're going to cause you to wonder. But always remember this, the God of heaven is never wonders. He doesn't slip. He doesn't go, oh no, what's going to happen? No, he doesn't have any of those moments. And he wants you to walk with him and allow him to lead you through those challenging days that you face in your life, whatever those are. And those come in a variety of forms, whether it's family, it's vocation, it's, it's whatever, or even issues in your faith. Let me lead you. Walk with me. Look at verse 31. Yet they that wait upon the Lord will what? They'll fall and their life's over, right? No. They will renew their strength. They will gain new strength, he says. They that wait upon the Lord. It's not about doing more. It's not about trying to figure it all out. That's my problem. It's all about trusting my God and allowing God to lead me and knowing that God has this in control. God knows what he's doing. God is in charge. And the king of the universe says, trust me and wait for me and I will strengthen you. And look at the image of strength here. It's not just like, you know, I'm going to, you know, buff you up a little bit. They will mount up with wings like eagles. Have you ever seen an eagle in flight? Is there anything more, I don't know if I'm weird, but I think that's one of the most beautiful, impressive things I have ever seen in nature is to see a, a bald eagle out there just doing what they, I mean, they're just, you know, just gliding. They're not really flapping the wings too much. They're just kind of doing their thing, walking around. Some poor uh, rodent is about to be lunch, but that's what they're doing, right? They're out there doing, that. it's amazing. And he said, you will mount up like that. You will be able to, that's the idea in your faith. You will Mount up with wings like eagles. You will run and not grow weary anymore. That sounds great, doesn't it? Now, he's not talking about your exercise. He's not really talking physically. He's talking spiritually, isn't he? He's saying, you'll be able to run. You will no longer be weary because why? He will be our strength. He is our source. He is the one who holds us up. It's not about what we do. It's not about my ability. It's not about knowing more, figuring it all out, and trying to find a better way. It's about understanding who my strength is. And you see, that's one of the things about eagles and other large birds that they're smarter than a lot of people are because they know, you know what, why they don't flap their wings? They know how to ride the current of the, the wind. They know there's shifts and all that. Did you know that? I didn't know birds were that smart. I thought they were dumb. They got those little brains, right? And where did they get that knowledge? How do you think that happened? They just evolved to that point, right? Yeah, that makes sense. How many times did they fall before they figured that one out? Good question. I'm waiting for, I still haven't got an answer from a couple of friends of mine who think they know everything. But anyway, God desires for us to have that same experience in our walk in the spirit, that we find our strength, our updraft, if you will, from the creator of the universe as he leads us on the path that he has for us. That's the exciting thing. It's not the path that I have or you have. It's not the way I want it to work out so that it all looks good to me. It's all about the path, direction, and purpose that he has for my life and for your life but it requires trust. It requires perspective that I realize who's in charge and who's not. And I don't know how it works for you, but for me, I am very grateful that I am not in charge of everything because I know how easily I would just totally mess everything up if I were in charge. Because with what little that often God puts me in charge of, I often make mistakes. That happens. Yes, I admit it. And so should you. It's good for the soul, right? But my God doesn't make mistakes. His purposes and his ways are clear. And he wants me to trust him. And maybe you've thought in your life and you're dealing with some circumstances that I don't fully understand and I can't comprehend and I'm, that's very possible. I'm pretty sure it's most likely in a place like this today but they're not above and beyond what God can do and figure out in your life and can walk with you in the middle of and carry you through and encourage you through and help you see his purpose and his plan even for those things that are hard to really just grapple with and understand because God is bigger than your circumstances. He's more powerful than anything you will face. Doesn't mean he'll fix it in the last moment. Everything's gonna be wonderful and we're all gonna dance happy and what it says, but it says he will be with us in the middle of it. And he loves us unconditionally. And that's his purpose and plan for your life, to learn to trust him. 
and to see things from his perspective. Would you pray with me, Father? Thank you for your word. I thank you for the the power that the prophet speaks, the words that he communicates so clearly about what it means to follow you, what it means to trust you. And Lord, I pray that for me, for all of us, that today we would begin to learn to do that with whatever areas we have in our lives. There's a lot of things that all of us, and in a crowd like this, a lot of folks have a lot of things going on, and that's okay. Things that I don't comprehend and understand, and that's not my purpose. I'll let the Holy Spirit and let you, let you take care of that. You understand it more clearly and completely than I do. And I pray, Father, you meet us where we are, but you draw us to where you want us to be. Thank you, Lord, for loving us, for being patient with us. And if there is one here today that has never experienced that life-changing encounter of a relationship with Jesus Christ, I pray today would be the day they would respond to you. For I ask all this in the name of Jesus Christ, our Lord and Savior. Amen.